everybody. I am Ari Graham. And I'm Jacob Wallerstein. So before we get into the meat of our talk today, we'd like to address something that we believe to be a problem in music today. So as our modern lives get more and more complex, music is increasingly becoming something to be put in the background of what we're doing, as opposed to something to be focused on while it's listened to. And we're going to refer to this type of unfocused listening as passive listening. And when you're passively listening to music, you are blind, or deaf, rather, to the multitudes of depth and emotion that it contains. And in our talk today, we would like to revive your ability to actively listen to music. Now, actively listening means you're able to focus clearly on the piece and understand what's going on within it. So you understand the role each note plays in the context of the piece. You understand the direction of the piece, but most importantly, you understand what the composer meant when he or she wrote the piece. And because you understand all these new things, um, there's a greater emotional impact on you. So overall, if active listening is a result of understanding, we'd like you to understand music better. And we're going to do this through a basic system called music theory. Music is capable of conveying the entire spectrum of human emotions, from the wildest of ecstasies to the darkest of depressions. When a composer sits down to write a piece in a certain mood, they don't stumble upon the notes that create that mood by chance. That would be like an author writing random letters down in sequence and hoping that the result makes sense to the reader. Now, composers know beforehand that building their piece in a certain way will result in the corresponding emotion. Composers can create the desired emotions at will using the system of music theory. Music theory essentially tells composers how to create the sounds that they want to hear, saving them that process of trial and error every time they want to write a piece. So knowing beforehand how to create those sounds allows composers to write pieces of music that seem impossibly complex, but when broken down into their component parts, as we'll do here in a moment, are actually quite simple. So the first component of music theory is the diatonic scale of demonstrating. So this is a simple scale made of seven notes, and you might not recognize the notes on the page, but um, you should be able to, like, they should sound familiar to you. So the notes are, there's seven notes, and they're labeled by scale degree, one through seven, and afterwards, uh, they keep repeating on the piano. So this means, in all, the same notes repeat in intervals of eight or octaves. So the next component of music theory is the chords, which are based on their bottom notes. So if we take, if we want to construct a one chord in C major, we start on one, and then we skip up twice to the three and five. And that'd be a one chord. So if we do that with five, we find the fifth scale degree, and then we skip up the same way. Now, where it gets interesting is when we start changing these chords throughout music, it creates emotion, and the chord changes are usually referred to as progressions or cadences, and they're defined by where they lead. So we have three main cadences that we're going to talk to you about today, being the half cadence, the authentic cadence, and the plagal cadence. So beginning with the half cadence, it is defined by, um, in any scale, moving from the first scale degree to the fifth scale degree. And its function is to create a sort of tension in the musical phrase. And it wants to be resolved. And it usually serves as the half point of the passage. So when you were um, wanting to resolve this tension, you would use the authentic cadence, which goes back from five to one and resolves that tension. So musical um, direction is provided when you uh, juxtapose these two cadences using the half cadence and then the authentic cadence, creating that tension and relieving it giving the phrase a sense of musical direction. And then the last cadence we're going to talk about is the plagal cadence, which essentially has the same tension release functionality as the, um, the half and authentic cadence, but it does so in a slightly different way in that instead of moving from one to five, like the half and authentic cadences, it moves from one to four. So you'll hear the authentic and half cadences, the interplay between that right here. And the plagal cadence you should recognize as the amen at the end of prayers. It has that same tension and release functionality. Now, the same rules apply um, in a minor scale in that um, a minor scale is essentially that same, or a different patterning of the same seven notes that generally conveys a sadder emotion than the major scale, as we'll hear here in a second. Now, when you're 
you're building chords, for example, in that key, the, the, um, the rules are still the same, like I said. So you'd still use that pattern of skipping up by two notes to create those chords. That would be a one chord in C minor. So now we'd like to dissect a little bit of Beethoven's sixth piano sonata to show you really how simple the music is. So if we start with the first theme, I'm just going to demonstrate. changes the key of the piece from F major, which the first theme within, was in, to C major, which the second theme will be in. You'll hear it then. So in this theme, the, uh, the chords, first of all, change less often. It's essentially a one, five, one thread, and the melody itself um, is more elongated than the first theme, or legato, as musicians say. Um, also, the, the melody itself, instead of just following the diatonic scale, it follows the notes in the chord almost perfectly. For example, when Beethoven plays the one chord, or Ari plays the one chord, the notes in that chord in the, yeah, are the notes in the melody. So when Beethoven moves to B5 of the scale with a half cadence, the notes in the melody continue to follow the notes in the chord. <coughs> this builds up immense tension, as I'm sure you felt. You want it to resolve to one, and thankfully Beethoven does provide us with that luxury. <laughs> so by building up that tension and then releasing it with the authenticated Beethoven resolves the theme. Now I'd like to play you um, a bigger portion of the sonata, and we'd like you to try to actively listen. And we know that you won't be able to um, search out all of these cadences, but we want you to basically be able to um, define the tension and release, and recognize that the notes are not complex, and music is really simple.
Thank you.